This is a revision video for the AQA inorganic chemistry topic of periodicity, specifically looking at the physical properties of the elements in period 3. The periodic table is divided into vertical columns called groups and horizontal rows called periods. Here we're looking at period 3, which is highlighted in blue, and we're using this as an example for describing the general trends that we would see across the periodic table. So although the AQA specification names period 3, it would be easy to ask you the same questions about period 2 and the same general trends would apply. The first physical trend that you need to know about is atomic radius. If we look at just the first three elements in period 3, you'll see that atomic radius decreases from 180 picometers for sodium to 150 for magnesium and 125 for aluminium. And this trend continues across the period, with the atoms getting smaller and smaller as you go left to right. As you go left to right across the periodic table, the atomic number is going up by one each time for each new element. And the reason for that is that each new element has one more proton in its nucleus, and therefore the positive nuclear charge is also increasing. Now, since the nucleus is positively charged and the electrons are negatively charged, there's an electrostatic force of attraction between them. So the nucleus is pulling those electrons closer and closer in and therefore the stronger the electrostatic attraction is, the closer those outer shell electrons will be to the nucleus. And that's why as we go left to right, we see those electrons being pulled in closer and closer. Now that on its own will be enough to get you one mark on the A-level paper, but this is usually a two mark question. And the second mark is for identifying that it wouldn't matter if there was more positive nuclear charge if we were also adding shells of electrons. So if you think about a particular group, maybe think about group one, potassium is a larger atom than sodium, even though it has more nuclear charge, because it has a whole entire extra shell. It has four shells instead of three, and therefore those outer shell electrons are further away. But if we think about just period three, all of the elements in period three have three shells. So the atoms have the same number of shells and therefore there is no increase in shielding. The second trend you need to be able to describe is ionisation energy. And this is a little bit more complicated because it isn't one single trend going left to right across the period. Firstly, let's remember that the first ionisation energy is the energy required to remove one electron each from one mole of gaseous atoms. The gaseous part is important and you're always expected to use state symbols when you represent this with a simple equation. Now, the general trend is easy to describe. Generally, as we go left to right across the period, the first ionisation energy increases. And this is because the number of protons is increasing by one each time. So the nuclear charge is still increasing. And you're trying to overcome the electrostatic force of attraction from a progressively more positively charged nucleus. So if we look at sodium and then magnesium, the first ionisation energy of magnesium is higher than sodium, because magnesium has one more proton in its nucleus, and therefore the outer shell electron that we're trying to remove in ionisation is experiencing nearly 10% more electrostatic attraction, and therefore it requires more energy to remove it. But of course that isn't the whole story, because we then get to aluminium, and the first ionisation energy drops. This is because the outermost valence electron in aluminium is in the 3p subshell, whereas for magnesium and sodium, it's in the 3s subshell. It's important when you're answering an exam question about this that you're naming these subshells and saying 3s and 3p, rather than just saying, oh, it's in a new subshell. You need the name of it. The important thing about the 3p subshell is that it's higher energy than 3s, and therefore it requires less energy to remove the electron from the atom. For silicon and phosphorus, we again see this general increase in the energy required due to their increased nuclear charge. And then when we get to sulphur, we again see a dip. Until this point, the first three electrons to go into the 3p subshell have had a whole orbital each, because of course they're all negative, so they're all repelling one another, so they'll stay as far apart as possible. With sulphur, the first of the 3p electrons needs to pair, and of course those electrons that are paired are still repelling each other, and that repulsion makes it slightly easier to remove the latest 3p electron. And then again, for chlorine and for argon, more protons means a higher nuclear charge, therefore a stronger electrostatic force of attraction between the nucleus and the outer shell electrons, and therefore more energy is required to remove that electron. 
While the specification talks about first ionisation energies specifically with respect to period three, it's important that you understand that the same trends apply for second and third and fourth ionisation energies. Subsequent ionisation energies are discussed in the physical chemistry specification, so you're expected to know that the second ionisation energy is the energy required to remove an electron each from one mole of singly positively charged gaseous ions, just as we have written in this symbol equation here. And you could be synoptically assessed in a question that asks you about the trends in second ionisation energy of period three elements. So for each of these subsequent ionisation energies, for the second and the third and so on, the trends will be the same, but each time the elements shuffle along one. So whereas aluminium sees a dip for the first ionisation energy, it will be silicon that sees a dip for the second and phosphorus for the third. In looking at second ionisation energies, there are two key things to note. Firstly, removing an electron from the second shell rather than the third requires far more energy because it's much closer to the nucleus. So sodium has a much higher second ionisation energy than the other elements, because that electron is removed from 2p, not from 3s. When we then get to the third ionisation energy, we'll see that magnesium suddenly sees a big spike, and so on and so forth. The second thing that you need to note is that all of these values are higher than the equivalent values were for the first ionisation energy. And that's because in each instance we're removing electrons from positive ions, and taking a negative particle from a positive object is harder than taking a negative particle from a neutral object. So again we then see that general trend of increasing left to right across the periodic table. And then, as we've said, the 3p versus 3s dip that we saw in aluminium for first ionisation energy, we now see for silicon with the second ionisation energy. Although the second ionisation energy for chlorine isn't actually lower than sulphur in the way that sulphur is lower than phosphorus for first ionisation energy, it is lower than you would expect if we were just having a general left to right trend. And again, this is due to the repulsion between the electrons sharing their 3p orbital. To discuss the melting points of period 3, we need to know what the structure and bonding of these elements looks like. Sodium, magnesium and aluminium are all metallic structures, whereas silicon is a giant covalent structure with thousands of atoms in one macromolecule, and then the remaining non-metals form simple molecules with 4, 8 or 2 atoms, or just monatomic argon. Knowing this helps us to explain the melting points of each element. If we look at sodium, magnesium and aluminium, these have comparatively high melting points because they're metallic structures, so it requires a lot of energy to overcome that strong electrostatic force of attraction between those positive cations and the negative delocalised electrons. But also we see that magnesium and aluminium have slightly higher melting points than sodium, and the reason for this is that they have a stronger electrostatic force because there's a higher charge density on the 2 plus and 3 plus ions compared to the single plus ions of sodium, and also there are more delocalised electrons, so overall we have that stronger electrostatic force. Because silicon forms giant covalent structures, this means that there are strong covalent bonds between every atom, and as we know, covalent bonds take a huge amount of energy to overcome, so silicon has a very, very high melting point. The remaining non-metals form simple covalent molecules, and these have comparatively low melting and boiling points. The reason for this is that it isn't the strong covalent bonds inside the molecules that are being overcome. It's the weak intermolecular forces between the molecules, so those van der Waals forces that you learnt about in your bonding topic in the year 12 physical chemistry, they're what are being overcome, and they are much, much weaker than strong covalent bonds. So because they're so weak, it takes comparatively little energy to overcome them, and therefore all of these non-metals, apart from silicon, which has this giant structure, have really quite low melting points. We can even explain the relative melting points of these four non-metals by looking at the size of their molecules. Since they're elements, all of their bonds are non-polar, and there are only weak van der Waals forces between molecules, or atoms in the case of argon. As the largest structure, with eight atoms per molecule, sulphur has the highest melting point, because it has the strongest van der Waals forces, and so therefore it requires the most energy to overcome these. Phosphorus, with four atoms per molecule, has a slightly lower melting point, and then chlorine with two, and finally monatomic argon. For the sake of completeness, we can also mention that phosphorus actually has two very common allotropes, white phosphorus and red phosphorus. 
white phosphorus consists of those P4 molecules that we've just mentioned, and it has a melting point of around 320 Kelvin. Red phosphorus is actually a macromolecular structure, rather like silicon, and it has a melting point above 820 Kelvin. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you found this a useful introduction to period three. If you did find it useful, then let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry content coming soon.